Yes. Yeah. Uh, because it is a weak acid, because it's a weak acid, it doesn't split up. Um, it stays together. So what is actually happening with this, when we learn about equilibrium, we'll see that some of them stay together and some of them, they break apart. So there is always some acetic acid molecule still in solution at any point. And then as some hydrogens uh, go to the product side, you still have that in the reactants. So those are monoprotic. Next is our polyprotics. For polyprotics, they may yield more than one hydrogen per molecule. They ionize stepwise. They lose only one H at a time. So they don't lose all of them at a time. You have to do one by one by one by one, depending on how many they have. Watch out for stoichiometry. So H3PO4 is a triprotic acid. Okay, in the first step here, if it reacts with something like sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide or lithium hydroxide or rubidium hydroxide or any of the hydroxides, the H3PO4 reacts with the OH, forming water, and you lose one hydrogen at a time, so you get H2PO4. Then that H2PO4 can react with an additional OH, step by step, to form another water and an HPO4 2 minus. And then that HPO4 2 minus can react with another hydroxide to form water and our phosphate ion at the end. So there's three steps for this process because it is triprotic. They go in that order. Yes? Uh, it could be anything almost. Sodium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide. Anything that is a strong hydroxide in this case. Or you could even deal with things that, um, like uh, something like magnesium hydroxide, for example. But this is just looking at the polyprotic side of it. So wherever you're getting the hydroxide from in this case. But it is a, a acid being added to a base. If the, if the base was not being added, then the acid would just stay the way it is. It would not um, lose these hydrogens in a three-step fashion. Uh, an, an example of a neutralization of a polyprotic acid would be if you had something like this. And this could be given on, again, this would be the information you'd be given. 100 milliliters of one molar phosphoric acid is added to 100 milliliters of one molar potassium hydroxide. So the first thing we would write down is the formula for the phosphoric acid. Now, I didn't write the potassium down. Why do you think I didn't write the potassium down? Okay, it's probably a spectator. Okay, it happens to be a spectator in this case. This often happens with any of the uh, soluble hydroxides. Now, the next thing to look at are the numbers we have here. So it's 100 milliliters of one molar, 100 milliliters of one molar. You have the same molarity and the same volume. So if you take molarity time volume, that gives you moles. So you have the same moles of phosphoric acid as you have of potassium hydroxide. So it's going to be a one to one ratio. But phosphoric acid has how many H's? Three H's. So if you add them together in an equal amount, it only removes one of the H's from the H2PO4, and that hydrogen, that proton, goes to the OH, to the water. Yes, sir? Um, could, could you say it goes farther because the root causes have two water? Which is uh, you can't go further because you run out of OHs. So this is, this is what is limiting the reaction. So it can't go any further because you, when you neutralize all the OHs, there's no additional OHs in solution. It's a neutral solution. It must have more OH, yes. Exactly. Yeah. Can you Uh-huh. So here, this you have H3PO4. It's a polyprotic acid. So one way of thinking about it, 
is the H goes from the H3PO4 over to the OH. And it's an H plus that's going. So that means the H3PO4, instead of being neutral, now has a negative one charge because it lost that proton. And it lost a hydrogen, so it has only two hydrogens. That's one way of looking at it. Now let's look at another example. I'd like you to write the equation for this reaction here. What happened? The carrot? No. Okay. So you have a carrot and a stick. <laughs> Sounds like economics to me. <laughs> hey, it's all right. You need a you need someone to get you in shape. It's all good. All right. So let's look at this one here. Now, what do you notice very quickly about these two? Okay, we have two of these for every one of those. So, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to go two hydroxides here. Two hydroxides. And if you got two hydroxides, that's going to give you two waters and one hydrogen phosphate. All right, so these reactions, hopefully a little bit more friendly. But we got to know acids and base. Now, what's going on here? So, let's think of a, another example. Please write the equation for this one here. But the other thing is to write it out and then cancel them out. But after you start writing, a lot of them are like sodium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide, potassium. It doesn't matter which hydroxide it is, it's an acid base reaction, so the metal doesn't matter. If it's a single replacement, then the metal does matter. So once you see what type of reaction it is, boom, you just go, oh my god, an acid, and then I got the OH, and then how many OHs? Oh, that's the only trick. All right, look at this. How many OHs should we have? Three OHs. There we go, and we got our phosphate ion. We're done. Yeah. Yeah. Only if the molarities are the same. If this was 25, this was 25, and that was three, it would be the same. Exact answer. But if they start tweaking it majorly, then you would get, obviously, you could get different answers. In this case, you're writing your reaction. If they start tweaking with the numbers, that's not reaction prediction, that's more so the young. Which we could do, but not in this type of prediction. Yeah? So, uh, correct. Yep. Yep. Well, 
Yeah, let me show you really quick. People are asking about this already, so I'll show you quickly. Uh, the cool thing about this is you're starting with phosphoric acid. Okay, so if you take 25 times 1, 25 times 1, there's 25 millimoles of phosphoric acid. Millimoles. Yeah, because it's milliliters. Moles times liters equals moles. Milliliters times molarity equals millimoles. Just an easy way of keeping track of them so you don't have to do that liter conversion. But the next thing is 75 times 1, this is going to be 75 millimoles. Now, since it's a 3 to 1 ratio, okay, if I had 25 of these initially, okay, and I want to neutralize it, my final amount is going to be 0 if I want it to be neutral, right? Neutral, neutral, neutral. So in this one here, I've got to lose 25. In this one here, we've got to lose 75. Over here, I'm going to gain. Oh, how much am I going to gain over there? 75, because you got 3 and 3. 75 millimoles. And how much of this are we going to have at the end here? 25. Now, this would be a stoichiometry problem if we wanted to solve it, but this is the same idea. We cancel out these here and these here. We're left with 75 millimoles of our water and 25 millimoles of our phosphate ion. This could tell us the concentration of phosphate ions in this reaction. It could also tell us how much water you made, even though that usually isn't as important for um, different uses. Yes? Um, in this problem here, yeah, it is important that there's H3 here, is that what you're asking? Yeah, because it's a 3 to 1 ratio, because it's a 3 to 1, it works out perfectly. If it wasn't, they wouldn't ask this, but if it wasn't, let's say you had four of these, okay, 100 milliliters, then you'd have leftover OHs. So you'd have leftover OH, you'd have excess OH, uh, that would be a good stoichiometry problem. If you have leftover OHs, you could calculate the pH of it if you wanted to, but not for reaction prediction only. All right, so let's try this one out. Can't read this anymore? Let me fix it. Where's my reader? There we go. Hydrogen phosphate. 
our barium and our two waters, and we are done. Now are we done? No. No. <laughs> what about now? We want stars? Yeah. All right. Ah, uh, good question. If it was not soluble, okay, acid base reactions happen in an aqueous solution. <laughs> Uh, if it was partially soluble, you'd have some of it. The thing that would be tricky about that, which wouldn't work well on a prediction, just plain prediction, but what would happen is the solid, if it's not, if it's completely insoluble, then you'd have nothing happening at all. But if it was partially soluble, you'd have some of those hydroxides, and in this case, let's say it was calcium, for example, calcium hydroxide, uh, some of the hydroxides would be going into solution, and the calcium would be going into solution. As those hydroxides go into solution, they'd be neutralized by this acid. But that would shift the solid, so more of the solid would break apart. So basically, the solution can handle a certain amount of the ions. And as you eliminate those ions due to an acid neutralizing, forming water, more ions could be released. So this is why acids can be used for cleaning, uh, cleaning solids around your tub or cleaning purposes. What they do is they dissolve the solids that are in that solution. Vinegar is a good one for weak acid, so it doesn't destroy everything, but it uses pretty things with it. So it's a long story. We'll learn about that when we get to solubility and equilibrium. Yeah. Do you think that moderately soluble is moderately soluble? Which one? Uh, moderately soluble. Moderately soluble, I would write it together. Um, Uh, calcium and strontium hydroxide. Uh, and there is no such thing as ammonium hydroxide. Why not? Because ammonium hydroxide breaks up into ammonium, ammonia, and water, NH3 and H2O. Uh, now, when we have weak acids, uh, this is usually with an acid mixed with an ionic salt. When you're approaching weak acid formation, it's the same thought process as a precipitation. Yeah. Huh? Uh, because the solubility rules say that they are an exception to hydroxides insoluble. So right down here, hydroxides, compounds containing alkali metals, ions, and barium ions are exceptions. So they are soluble, for sure, 100% of the time. Now, solubility. Uh, weak acids are always written together. In water, the hydrogen will bond with anions to form weak acid molecules. These are some exceptions. CL, BR, I, and OP. Wait, these exceptions look familiar. Those are the anions of the what? Of the scary six. There it is. They're back again. They do not form weak acids, so they obviously are not in there. All right. These never bond with hydrogen and water. That's why they are strong acids. They are always, always separate. So if you have extra H's, they will form weak acids. Weak acid molecules, except for the scary six. So, how would it look? Hydroiodic acid is added to aqueous lithium nitrate. So, formula for hydroiodic acid. Hi, HI, but it has to be separate because it is strong acid. Then the H and the anion go together, HNO2. Plus I plus L I. Yep.
if you have a uh, if you if you have a TGA strong acid here mixed with an ionic salt, it can form a weak acid. So it, it usually isn't talking about the strong acids. Technically, if you had a weak acid with an ionic salt, you could get another weak acid. So this one here is a strong acid added to a ionic salt. Yeah. Because it has the word hydro in front. Hydro means it's binding. Either it's ionic or it means it's ionic. It's hydro ionic, so it's only two. So on this one here, we got HNO2 plus I plus Li. Those are mine. Please pick it up and put it back when you're done. So here is our HNO2 added together. This is the formation of a weak acid. And you'll notice the iodine and the lithium both cancel out. Next one. for the hydrobromic. So we've got to put our coefficients in there. Okay, now we look at putting it together. We add the two H's to the PO3, three negative. These two get added together, giving us H2PO3 negative. We still have the two bromines, bromide ions, the two sodiums left over. Huh? Yeah, shouldn't there be three sodiums? Yeah, you want three? Yeah. Only one on that side? Yeah. So. So the sodium here, and three sodiums there, and three sodiums there. Now, the great thing about the sodiums is does it really even matter? Nope. Nope, don't matter at all in this case. The spectators, who cares? We don't care about them. I cared so little about them, I didn't even know. I really don't care about them. I'm sorry. I cared about these because they are double concentration. I gotta consider that. Yeah, poor sodium. So it's all right. I'll put you on my fries, sodium chloride. All right. So that's it. Put them together. We're good to go. Two H. H2PO3 negative. That is our weak acid formed by this reaction. Yes? This is your answer that goes in the box. All the rest of this shindigs, you can do whatever you want. So if, if you made that mistake, guess what? They don't care. They're not going to mark you down. They're looking in the box. What's in the box? There it is. Boom. 
So, spectators, yeah, if you cross them out early, do you know the spectators? Boom, that's just easier for you. If you balance them and then cross them out, you're doing the right chemistry. So I agree with the correction. Yeah, it should have been a 3-3. Three, three. It happened to not matter in this case. But if I messed up on this one, boom, then I got the wrong answer, then I'm, you know, unfortunate. So stoichiometry has to be considered. Now, here's some special cases. We had the good ones, now we got the special ones. Special cases, what happens here? So weak acid formation, watch out for decomposers. Watch out, if you form a weak acid and it decomposes, you can't write the weak acid as an answer. Got to show it decomposing in the next step. So sulfurous acid decomposes into SO2 and H2O. If you make H2SO3, write it, write it as SO2 plus H2O. And what's our other decomposer? Carbonic acid. Breaks down CO2 and water. So you got CO3 or SO3, those two break down. So I accidentally pushed my was it working? <laughs> now I think this is the third or fourth time we've seen these decomposers. Okay? Sometimes I call them posers for short. They never, never present themselves in our products. So special cases, all we got to do is watch out for the decomposers. So let's see what happens with a decomposer. Sodium sulfide mixed with concentrated hydrochloric acid. Expect the sulfide to be SO what? SO3. So since this is a special case, you know there's going to be decomposure on the product side probably. But with that in mind, swap partners. H2SO3 plus Na plus 2Cl. The H is connected to the SO3 here, and the Na and the Na, CL and CL. So what do we do next? Okay. Cancel our spectators. But H2SO3, as we know, is a what? Decomposer. So H2SO3, the next step in the reaction is H2SO3 breaks down into H2O and SO2. Now on the left side of the equation, you got H2SO3. Right side, you got H2SO3. Those cancel out. Now your equation is this plus this, making that and that. So there's your final written answer. Yes? 2H pluses? Uh, because this charge is too negative, so the acid here I mean, sorry, the sodium sulfide has to be 2Na for why, every one of these. Why, why? For the H plus, in order for that to work here, um, in order for the H plus to work here, you need to have um, the balanced formula for the uh, product here. So you need to have two H's to combine with this for it to be neutral. That's where those twos came from. Yep. So this is a way of showing the reaction step by step. Yep. Um, well, what they did was, what we did here is we showed these are reactants, these are products. Then we show, wait a minute, that's not actually a product, it has to go through another step. It decomposes. So this is the decomposition reaction here, shown. But since I have the same thing on the right and left, that's why it cancels out. Oh, 
So it's showing that next step in the reaction. Just like uh, polyprotics have multiple steps, step by step by step, this one is showing the multiple steps and crossing out the same thing on reacting to products. <laughs> yeah. What's concentrated mean? Uh, concentrated means that you will have lots of these. So it's a, it's such a high concentration that you have an excess of hydrogen. So that's one other reason we could write a two here. If it was dilute, then you wouldn't know that you, you could have more. So concentrated is to tell you I got you got an excess of that present in solution. So there's lots of H's floating around. So just like when we do our redox, when we have lots of H's floating around, that's why you can add H's at will to one side of the reaction. All right, let's look now. All right, this time we're going to look at redox and aqueous solution. So redox and aqueous solution, we have performed a redox reaction in aqueous solution. We're doing redox predictions. There are a couple things you want to keep in mind. Okay, first of all, solutions are mixed without precipitates or any other reaction. So don't have a precipitate, there's a chance it can be redox in aqueous solution. Acidified solution or acid as reactant. So that's a hint. If it says it's acidified or it has an acid in the reactants, it could be redox. It's usually either redox or acid base. Not an acid. Not always, but most likely. These are the other ions you want to look for. If it has that, it's redox. Very, very, very high chance. Very high chance. It'll usually give you more information that'll confirm your suspicion. All right, do you guys recognize this ion here? Yeah? Now, when you have a redox reaction in aqueous solution, the rule is you're going to look for the winner and the loser. The winner and the loser of electrons. So to do this, one way of doing this is by looking at the redox agents and their products and by using the reduction table. So we're going to look at how do you determine the winner and the loser of electrons for a redox in aqueous solution. If the reaction is in acid, if the reaction is in acid, the H plus goes to H2O. So those are things to remember when we're looking at an aqueous solution that has oxidation and reduction happening. What do you mean H plus goes to In the reaction, the hydrogens here, the hydrogens here tend to uh, gain <coughs> electrons to become water. So when it gains electrons, it becomes a stable molecule of water. So that's why we could add water or hydrogens to the respective sides of the equation when we balance it. So if it's acidified, we can do this. If it's not acidified, we just have to watch out for the, again, the last steps. So this is a, again, one thing that always can happen in acidified solution. Now, these are common oxidizing agents. This is a double star, please remember these. So common oxidizing agents. 
These would be ones you'd want to memorize. I'll give you a moment to write them down if you would like to write them down. Uh, everything is online. You'll notice that two of them are in bold. Oxidation state in manganese here. Okay, plus seven. So it's going plus seven over two, two plus. Okay, that is again a common oxidizing agent. That means that the, if it is an oxidizing agent, it is being what? It's being what? Reduce. Very good. So it's an oxidizing agent, it is being reduced. In this case, it's going from plus 7 to plus 2. So it's going from plus 7 to plus 2. So in order for it to do this, does it have to gain or lose electrons? It has to gain electrons. It has to gain electrons. OK? So it has to gain how many electrons total? Five electrons for that process. Five electrons for that process. Okay, now if you look at this one here, CR2O7. Okay, seven times two, that's 14. This has to be six or 12 total to be negative two. Each CR is plus six, and here it goes to plus three. So you're going from plus six to plus three. Is that gaining or losing electrons? It's gaining electrons as well. So both of these are oxidizing agents. They are being reduced. Now, some people like to remember this about what happens to these numbers? They're going down. They are reducing. The numbers are reducing. The numbers are going down. That's another way of remembering the oxidation and reduction. This is reduction. Oxidizing agents are being reduced. Okay. Oxidizing agents are losing electrons. That means those electrons are going to something else which is becoming oxidized. They are causing the oxidation to occur. They are reducing. The compound is reducing. Yep. Um, this one is an acid, so it's dilute acid and concentrated acid. This one's an acid as well, so it has to be hot. Yeah. What? No, oil rig works fine. This is just another way to think about it. Yeah, you can always think of it two different ways. All right, now, since we know these common oxidizing agents, these are always the winners of electrons, electron winners, all right? So, you know these, you know the winners. 
So, how do we determine the winners and losing losers? Yep. Nope, I mean them all. All of them. Oh, those two are very common. Very common. Yeah, very easy to work with in the lab. For example, we don't work with hot concentrated sulfuric acid very often. It tends to cause a lot of problems. Dilute nitrix, fabulous, but it has its own reactivity. Concentrated, we try to reduce the concentrated, hot concentrated, and dilute. And this here is, uh, well, hydrogen peroxide can be quite explosive because of its reactivity and because of the uh, redox reaction. But, because <laughs> we don't want to hurt ourselves or others. All right. Now, here are acids that are as strong. These are acids that are strong oxidizing agents. So your sulfuric, your nitric. So wait, why? Why? Are, easier, pardon me. Why are uh, permanganate and bisulfate the only the other ones, but they're not the strong oxidizing agents? Uh, those two usually have color changing compounds. And so they can be used as indicators as well as um, oxidizing agents. Yes, sir. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, you should call the electron winners. We'll get to the winners when they lose again. Are they all the winners? Yeah. So these here are strong oxidizing agents. Okay, that are acids. So if we look at acidified sodium dichromate solution, keyword there you should see is acidified, that means it's going to be redox. Sodium dichromate solution, mixed with aqueous iron 2 chloride. So the first thing we know, we've got acidified, so we've got extra H's lying around. We've got our sodium dichromate solution and our aqueous iron 2 chloride. Those are our reactants. Okay, one thing we know is the hydrogen is going to go to water. Okay, we know our dichromate is going to turn into chromium-3. That is definitely the winner of the two, because it's one of the ones on our list. And it is being reduced. So, winner, then you have to figure out, is it being oxidized or reduced? Mm, I didn't say that. They're losing electrons. I mean, they're gaining electrons. You're right. Yeah. The winner always reduces, right? That's what I thought. Whether or not. Yeah. 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 So now we got to find the loser here. So the options for losers are Na, Fe, or Cl. So which one would you guess if you just had to guess without thinking about it? <laughs> yeah. Losers, they don't they don't even make their way in the classroom. No, no, no. What is it? What's the point? Yeah. Uh sure you can have two CLs, you can have two NAs. But they're probably gonna be what? They might be spectators. We'll see. Alright, so good predictions, they might be spectators. So we have to look at the potential losers. Okay, Na. Okay, if it is again losing electrons, it could be Na2 plus plus an electron. That's one option. That doesn't happen. And it can't lose more than one electron. 
No, it's not a reducing agent. It is not being oxidized. It's not a reducing agent. So Fe2, could it go to Fe3? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Chlorine. Oh, wait a minute. Chlorine can go to chlorine gas plus two electrons. Oh boy. So now we got two choices here. Those are both reducing agents. So how do we know which one is the potential loser? Yeah. Oh no, I was asking, how do you know if it's not a reducing agent? Ah. So this here, this was our potential um, substance that was being oxidized, it's called a reducing agent. So if it's losing an electron, this would be it's what its equation would look like. Okay. This, if it's losing an electron, it would look like this. This, if it's uh, losing two electrons, would look like this. So these are our e equations. Now, this one does not work because one thing about it is sodium, when it loses one electron, it's then like neon. The other reason is it's not on our um, reduction uh, table. So that's not on there, so it can't be either forward or backwards. It's not on there, but that's how it works. Not like this. Not like that. Yeah. So hydrogen plus hydrogen H plus going to H2O is not oxidizing. The H plus going to H2O that is gaining electrons. So that's reduction. Yeah. There's two reductions. There were two potential reductions, and we found out which one was the winner of those two. And now we're looking at all the losers. Because it was one of the uh, strong oxidizing agents, the chromate. Dichromate going to chroma, chromium 3. So we've got two reducing agents. Where do you think we look to find out which one is the potential loser? Table. So here's our reaction here and our reaction here from the table. Okay. So we've got a couple different ions here. And we've got the chlorine option here. So with the chlorine, you'll notice here that the chlorine is going the wrong way. If we turn that around, we would have to put a negative sign on the voltage. If he's also going the wrong way, because again, these are being oxidized, so they reverse. And this here, Okay. That is not oxidation there. So Fe2 going to Fe3, it has the biggest positive, most positive voltage. And so that is our that is our loser. So you get the equation. Can you find the voltage for that equation if you have to reverse the equation in order to get the correct oxidation because these were both oxidation? And this one is the one closest to positive or closest to the highest positive, so that is the potential loser or the loser reaction. So it's the one that's losing electrons, and then the uh, dichromate is, uh, the chromium, sorry, is gaining those electrons. Okay, so those are the steps to go through. Find the winner, then find the loser. Once you have the winner and the loser, now you have how many half reactions? Two, Two half reactions. You're going this way, 
Once again, with electrons here. It's taking the iron ions and reducing them to iron solid. So you're looking at this, Fe2 plus is where you're starting from. So you're starting with Fe2 plus. This is possible because that is oxidation. This is not possible because you start with this and that has to be reduced. So it's not possible to do that step because it's not oxidation. So your starting materials are important. That's why the arrow went the other way. You have chloride, you had uh, iron, iron two. Chloride going that way, iron two going that way. Oh wait, this one can't because you can't go this way because it's not oxidation. Okay, all right, good question. So now that we've got our half reactions, we know what to do next. Okay, we know that's our winner and that is our loser. This is the same one. We've got our winner, we got our loser. Now we just need to balance the half reactions. So first thing is we balance the everything but O and H. Then we balance the O's. Then we balance the H's. And we balance our reactions. The electrons on each side. Multiply it all through by six to get the same number of electrons on each side. Then we can add them up. Because you had to balance the CR first, or at least you had to balance it at some point, at least. Six electrons or six electrons here. Why are there six electrons here? There's 14 positive and two negative, that's 12 positive. On this side, there's 2 times 3, there's 3 positive. So you have 12 positive on this side, 6 positive on this side. You need 6 electrons to bring it back down to the same charge. So that is balancing the electrons, and then you equilibrate out the electrons by multiplying by 6 through the bottom. Other questions on the sets right here? This is what our quiz is on on Friday. Just the balancing portion. Not predicting, just balancing. Yeah. Just balancing. Just balancing a redox. So you don't need to ask anything. You don't have to do it. So it's not like a not as complex as this one. Yeah, you'd be given this information here. So, so remember, remember how we had problems with the first one we did where we were like, how do we know what to do? what is the same on both sides. Okay, the electrons cancel on both sides of 14 H's. There we go, six Fe's plus two. Chromium, waters, and our six iron threes. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Quiz on Friday, I'm giving you the half reactions. AP test, not so nice. Correct. It will say whether it is an acidic solution or a basic solution for the quiz. Correct. Because I want to make sure that you can follow these steps to get to here. Because if you do all this great predicting winners and losers and then you screw up on this step, you don't get as many points as you'd like. So it would be. 
But it happens to the best people when they're not careful. Everybody else happens to them all the time. All right. And you guys are the best. Here we go. For this example, we're going to see if we can predict the winners and losers. So what I'd like you to do is first write down the ions that are present in the reactants. We got H in there, right? Yeah. Anything else you want in there? Okay. Okay. Uh, if the K is probably going to be a what? Uh, I don't do it till the end sometimes. Yeah. How do you? No. If it's important, you'll bounce it. But yeah, I'm just right. I showed up. These are just the ions. There's no stoichiometric bounds. The H is acidified. Yeah, acidified. Acidified means there's extra H just floating around. So that's where the H came from. So that means the two possible. Reactions we have, trying to figure out which one is the winner. We've got H going to H2O. All and what's the other one that is a potential winner? CR2O7. CR2O7. Why was it in gold and bold before? Because it tends to show up a lot. So, who's the winner here? There you are, dichromate. Now, potential losers. What are the potential losers? Potassium, what else? Sodium or? Sulfide. Hydrogen is a potential winner because hydrogen is gaining electrons to form water. Hydrogen with a plus one has no electrons currently. When it connects to oxygen, when two hydrogens connect to oxygen, they then share electrons, and because of that, it is gaining electrons to form water, or it's eliminating that positive charge by a negative coming in, which is an electron. So finding the loser, we got our potential losers, K, Na, or SO3. So potential losers. Okay, this is oxidation, so losing electrons, that's K. That doesn't happen. Na, does that happen? Nope, that doesn't happen either. Na plus, okay, does not tend to lose any more electrons, so obviously it's got to be H2O, no. SO3, 2 minus. So let's check that out, SO3, 2 minus. Is it a reducing agent? <coughs> so if it's a reducing agent, that means its charge has to go what? I mean, its oxidation number has to do what? Go up. Very good. Because it's a reducing agent, it is being oxidized. Its charge, I'm sorry, its <coughs> oxidation number is going up. So, is this a possible option, SO4 or 2 minus? Absolutely. This number is going up. So, once you've got your winner and once you've got your loser, now what do you get to do? Okay, now you get to add the after reactions. Yes, question? 
How do we know what? Potential loser. Those were all of the other ones that were left over, things that were not potential winners. Long time spectator ions, you have to check them, yes. It's either going to be a winner or a loser, and then it'll be the real winner or the real loser. The real loser is losing electrons, the real winner is gaining electrons, and everybody else is just spectating. Yep. Yeah. Ah, the number of oxygens changed here. The main reason why here okay, is these two electrons, okay, these additional two electrons um, had to come actually from an additional oxygen, and that oxygen probably came from water. So the water is always able to contribute additional oxygens. So the oxygens do not have to be equal for a happiness. CR207, CR plus three, those aren't equal. So the O's do not have to be equal, do not have to be balanced at this point for any reason. So you can use O's um, to help you if you need uh, additional electrons, for example. In this case, we're going from plus four uh, to plus six is losing electrons. In order for that to happen, another O is placed in there um, for that to happen. The other reason, is we know S and O, how do they connect together? This is the only other option with S and O. Like carbon and oxygen, you could do carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. Um, those are options available, yeah. So the O's don't have to be balanced when they're Correct. Happy actions, they don't have to be balanced. You can't just add a single O on one side though. It's not allowed. Oh, it's combined. Yes? Okay. So on this one here, question of why doesn't it work? Why doesn't it work? There are two places you can look. Uh, one place you can look is um, at the, uh, the uh, reduction potential table. And you look for this equation here. So, if this was being oxidized, you'd have to lose an electron. So I said, if K plus loses one electron, it becomes K2 plus. Then I look at the list. If it's not there, it doesn't happen. The other reason it doesn't happen, for real, why do we know this, is because K is right here. K has 19 electrons originally. If it loses one electron, it becomes K plus. How many electrons does it have now? It has 18. What chemical is this? Argon, which is a noble gas. Noble gases are unreactive. So once it loses that electron, the K plus is also unreactive. That's another reason, and we will learn more about that as we go, why that is. All right, ladies and gentlemen, continue practicing. With the reactions. Uh, some things you'll want to know. Uh, the arc, uh, reaction PS3, 4, and 6, you will not be able to do all of those yet, but you should be able to start them. We'll be going over uh, redox reactions in more detail tomorrow.